Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. Today, I interview Simon Crompton, the founder of Permanent Style, where he focuses on bespoke and craftsmanship in Britain and around the world. Welcome, Simon. Hi, nice to be here. Thanks for, thanks for making the time. I really appreciate it. So, Simon, you studied philosophy, politics, and economics, but you're a journalist today. Can you share with us the journey you know, it took you from university to where you are today? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I studied PPE, as you said, uh, at Oxford. I went to Trinity College. Um, I didn't really have any uh, ambition to be a philosopher or a politician or an economist. Um, even though a lot of people go to Oxford, do PPE and become politicians, it's more seen as a general arts course that I think people do before going into lots of different professions. And I was also always quite a big traveler and writer and writing was something I always really liked doing. And so journalism was one of the, the areas I wanted to go into and try first of all. So when did you know that this is something you wanted to do? I'm not sure I necessarily knew for sure. It was kind of what I applied doing and what I started out um, trying for as a career. But I think the big thing with careers a lot of the time, certainly I would say to anyone starting out in that kind of situation, is that you you really only learn the kind of things you like about a job when you've been doing it for a while. Um, it's very hard at the beginning to assess exactly what you want to do. And your image of journalism probably isn't the kind of thing you're going to be doing. But at the same time, there'll be things you really enjoy about it that you, know, you couldn't really appreciate, appreciate beforehand. Of course. But did you do an internship or did you just you know apply somewhere and then stay there all your career? Or what I were did. the different steps? To, to... Yeah, I didn't do. Well, I did, did a couple of little kind of things during university. Um, I worked for a summer at a company called NERA in Boston. It's National Economic Research Associates. Worked there for a summer. Um, did a couple of placements at some newspapers here in London. Uh, one at the Daily Telegraph and uh, one at the Guardian. Just to kind of sort of work experience things really for a week. Um, but then I was quite lucky to, I applied age 21 or whatever, applied to the same company I work at now and got a kind of graduate journalism position. Oh, wow. So how long have you been with the company then? Uh, 13 years now. Wow. Okay. So what's, what's your day-to-day -day work there? Um, so I started out as a graduate journalist. I was a writer and reporter, um, writing mostly about finance, capital markets, and M&A. Um, I then sort of graduated to be the deputy editor of that magazine. After a few years, I went to work for another magazine uh, called Global Investor, I looked more at the asset management side. Um, then I came back, worked on another magazine called Mac Electoral Property about patents and trademarks. Oh, um, yeah, so I ended up and sort of edited that and also the original magazine. So ran those two magazines. And then about two years ago, I kind of transitioned into a uh, sort of head of product role. Um, so we have a group of magazines across the legal group here, and I lead their new product launches, product development, that kind of thing. Very interesting and very different from permanent style. So it <laughs> sounds like permanent style is just a, a side gig, and uh, you still like are with your heart in, in something else, or how would you describe the relationship between I think I probably patent stuff and permanent style? Yeah, I think, um, and I would say that I, I really like both jobs and the things I get out of them, which are very, very different to each other. Um, I was talking to a friend recently, actually, who works in the fashion industry as well. He also does quite a lot of kind of real estate investing on the side, which is where he had mm -hmm. come from before. Um, and actually, we were saying it's, it often makes a very good partnership because fashion and craft and style is, is great in many respects. It's something you love. It's very visual. It's very tactile. It's very emotional. But... Um, Frankly, don't meet many companies in this industry that you'd kind of be excited to work for from a professional point of view or a management point of view. Um, the big fashion companies are often very conservative. Um, uh -huh. Small kind of craft-based companies are great places to work, but often horrendously disorganized and not really businesses from that point of view. Um, so I think if from the, in the day job, I work with incredibly intelligent, driven, highly educated people and get a very different stimulation to what I get from writing about fashion. Okay, I can, I can totally see that. So how do you split up the time between permanent style and, and the other stuff? Is it like 50-50 or is it 30-70? It's probably 70-30 with more on the day job. Um, so I work nine to five 
in the day job and then I mostly write my blogs in the evenings of the um, and then I kind of take time off if I'm doing traveling or I have particular projects like writing books and so on. Mm. How would you describe the state of you know, print menswear journalism today versus online menswear journalism? Um, I think print menswear journalism is having a tough time. Um, a lot of the old magazines that people used to read like GQ and Esquire are kind of struggling to stay connected to a more intelligent and craft based kind of audience. Um, and you have some, some new kind of interesting startups, um, people like Port or Gentleman's Journal and other magazines that are doing some uh, interesting, look, looking far more at the craft side and the quality side, but they always kind of hampered. And I think, and I think the rake has found this to a certain extent as well, that because of the really high print costs of doing that kind of magazine and because of the high margins of some of the luxury products and therefore the high advertising spend available, they often end up becoming basically just kind of luxury magazines filled with expensive cars and expensive watches and expensive whiskeys, which don't really connect to most people. Um, and it becomes well, very often, right? This is just like they, they reach out to brands and say, Hey, do you want to be featured? And uh, we charge you X amount for it. And yeah. you know, it, it's not like an ad. It's just a, a roundup with pictures of things that looks very editorial, but it's in fact an ad. Yeah, it's quite it's quite depressing. You see some of those kind of contracts with the magazines, and you know, a brand in return for X thousand of advertising this year will be promised X pages of support this year. You know, and they're just saying we're basically going to write about you if you pay this amount, and it's just quite depressing as a reader. I think that's actually what I'm kind of being, uh, what I'm paying to read. You know, there's no curation or no kind of input into it at all. It's just whoever's got the most money is going to be featured in the magazine. Let's um, switch more to to like style based questions, um, and I think I, I've read that you kind of described your style often as British style is sold to the Italians, which is kind of a phrase coined by by Michael Drake. He always <laughs> used that. Can Good you phrase. describe like your approach to that and what it means to you? Mm. Um, I suppose there's a few different elements to it. I think um, I tend to be I tend to be fairly conservative in terms of color and pattern. Um, I think I wear you know wear a lot of navies and greys. Um, I think it's for me. I think it maybe goes back to that kind of initial uh, period where you were getting into tailoring, and it was about the thing that really struck me was the beauty of a great cut and great line and fit. And that's the thing I've always found most attractive um, rather than outrageous colors or unusual fabrics or kind of bright you know, clashing things going on. So it's always been quite subtle and conservative from that point of view. But I think that means that it highlights the kind of fit and quality aspects more. Tell us more about this Italian Brit thing. Hmm. Um, well, it's, you're always playing with stereotypes, aren't you? Um, but there's obviously a kernel to truth to both of them. Um, I think, you know, uh, English people kind of envy the Italians kind of suave, um, their kind of swagger and kind of attitude. Um, whereas a lot of kind of Italians really envy the kind of what seems like a uh, very kind of quiet confidence to English people that dress well you know, um, to not care necessarily about the immediate impression you make, um, to be very comfortable in your clothes and comfortable in yourself. Um, I think it's interesting when you see other kind of countries talk about this. So I remember talking to some guys in Stockholm about kind of Swedish style being somewhere between kind of Italian and English. And they were saying that Swedish guys dress very well and often kind of an English style, but Unfortunately, like the Italians, they're also kind of very, very self-conscious and very insecure and kind of uh -huh. want to kind of therefore kind of um, portray themselves as confident or what kind of what they wear. Um, so I think there's, I think a kind of midpoint, I think between those two is kind of very attractive where you, you have, have your own attitude and character and you're not quite as meek as the, the English um, uh, stereotype, but at the same time, you're very comfortable in Kind of what you wear and you don't need to kind of impress people in kind of how you wear things so you're comfortable wearing 
um, I know old clothes, um, things that are obviously worn and loved. Um, I was I was remember talking to a friend a couple of days ago about an interesting example of um, analysing how royalty um, is portrayed in, in portraiture, particularly to compare kind of Northern European versus Southern European, which is obviously kind of Protestant and Catholic comparison to a certain extent. Um, but if you look at how, say, you know, Italian or Spanish royalty would portray themselves, there's often a lot of pomp and circumstance. There's a lot of kind of gold, um, mm-hmm. finery and, you know, drapery and everything like that. Whereas um, on this particular, I suppose, more modern period, most of the, if you saw a, a Dutch royal family or a German royal family or something kind of being portrayed, um, there'd be much less of that kind of going on. Their interiors are much more somber and conservative, but are very high quality. And somebody of the time looking at it would know this person was rich because they had, you know, internal running water or, you know, they had a massive fire or they had lots of books or other things that signified wealth, but it was a very kind of subtle um, indication of wealth and knowledge and education rather than the kind of Spanish or Italian, which is a bit more kind of over the top. All right, good. Um, I think one of the big words in, in craftsmanship and clothing today is handmade. And and if you look what's described as handmade, there's a huge kind of area, right? Like I would sometimes think it's it's abused or misused. Yeah, yeah, yeah what absolutely. Is your definition of handmade and when is something handmade and you know where's the line? <sighs> I don't think, I think, unlike a lot of words, like I think this should have a very clear definition. I'm not sure that handmade should have a clear definition necessarily because it's very hard to say you've got, say, bespoke shoemakers who are sewing everything by hand, sewing the wealth of the soul by hand and, and sewing the, um, the wealth and the soul by hand. Um, and then you've got people making very, very high level bench made shoes in Northampton or other places. Um, where they could equally say it's a handmade garment, handmade shoe, but what they're doing is is very carefully guiding the product through a machine. Um, exactly that, right. You have a person sitting there on the machine, like the mm-hmm. sewing machine. Is this handmade or not? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose you, when someone thinks of handmade, they just mean something which isn't entirely mechanized. You know, it's not sort of three D printed and just being, you know, shut out entirely by a machine. But you know, if you try and say that bespoke shoes had, could be handmade, but kind of benchmade shoes could just be called benchmade, benchmade is never going to mean anything to anybody, you know. But so if I'm if, if we're trying to convince young guys to not make a kind of a shoe and get something decent that's benchmade, I don't have a problem with them calling that handmade shoe. Frankly, you know, it's I wouldn't be quite so. I, I think that's it's already. I suppose it's already just a very broad term in itself whereas maybe something like bespoke is actually quite a, a narrow term which is being kind of stretched out of its kind of original meaning where is the point sometimes where you think a machine actually provides a better result such as you know with a shiny socks maybe or, or like in a suit like where would you say actually more handwork doesn't make the product better but worse yeah i think well i think the problem with handwork is it's very volatile so you get good handwork and it's very very bad handwork you know i can sew but it's awful you know if it's still a handmade garment or whatever i'm doing and if i'm if i'm darning a sweater i do it very very badly but you know theoretically that's handwork um i suppose um one clear definition to, one clear clarification to make would be things that physically can't be done by machine so things like a saddle stitch that's used on hand-sewn leather goods or used on the hand-sewn welt and sole of a shoe um, cannot be replicated by a machine because a machine can't go in and out of the needles and overlap itself. So that's a clearly... Not yet, at least. Not let it... You no, know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it'll happen one day. And, and maybe I'll be brave enough then to say that that's just as good as a, as a, as a hand-sewing, hand-sewing uh, job. But yeah, so that's kind of one area, I suppose you could say that that's definitely kind of better. But almost everything else, I'd, I'd say, hand sewing is ne- never necessarily better than 
than machine. You know, I've seen some really, really badly done hand sewn tailoring, and I've seen some machine made garments that are in, you know incredibly done. I think you know when it comes to bespoke, a lot of times people talk about the jacket, right? And uh, many things have been said, and then you've written about the importance of a floating canvas and the cut, you know, an individually cut pattern for you. Mm. But what I find is often neglected are, are trousers and pants. So in your opinion, what, what are the important things to, to focus on with trousers and pants? Hmm. Um, I think trousers and pants are a, a lot simpler. Um, I have no problem with somebody who has even a, um, a ready-to-wear line he really likes and maybe gets altered in a couple of places by somebody. Um, but it's very, um, but it's a decent quality, it's a decent material. Um, I think you can, as long as you get a, a trouser which has a good line that you like through the leg and fits you well on the waist, then there's kind of that's not, as much, not much more you need really from that point of view. And a little bit like shirts as well, you kind of, I think in trousers you want kind of consistency. Um, you want, you probably, you don't really want that many different styles of trouser. You want most of the time the same style, but it's in lots of different weights and colors and materials to choose from. Whereas a jacket, you're going to want to want very more the the pals and the shoulder and the sleeve and so on, because it makes much more of a difference to the overall impact. No, I agree. I mean, a jacket is obviously much more complex and it's, it's justified that it's talked about more. At the same time, you know, when I had my first pair of bespoke trousers, I could really see the difference, you know, like just the way the crease fell in the front and the back, it was just mm. clean and straight. And it was yeah. something I've never had with a ready to wear or, or made to measure product. And I thought, you know, yeah. it, it really makes a difference when you look at it, but mm. most people kind of neglect it basically. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I suppose it's kind of, they're often, they're finer details and they're, you know, and, and smaller differences. And as a result, they're less likely to make an impact and people are less likely to notice, but you know, but you're right. There's no difference is always going to be there. I think it also makes a difference whether you, um, if you like braced trousers, which I don't, I don't usually wear, then that's very hard to get ready to wear. And a, a good braced trouser with a tailored jacket, um, can be, can look incredibly elegant. It makes a huge difference. Well, and, and you know, it's, I always think it's, you can either find now, even ready to wear, they sometimes offer the high waisted trousers for braces, but mm -hmm. then they're usually a little wider cut. So if you, let's say you want like a slimmer, narrower cut at the leg, kind of more modern, but a high waist, that's very mm -hmm. difficult to find off the Yeah, rack. that's true. That's true. I suppose the only thing I'd say is that's kind of, you can narrow the trouser, trouser leg fairly easily and kind of alter the style of the trouser quite a lot. Whereas if you try and make, making that kind of degree of change, the style of the jacket is a lot harder, but yeah. Yeah, true, 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 okay. So I read, you know, like a few years back, you were a big fan of like Turnbull and Astor bespoke shirts. Now earlier mm. you said, you know, the difference between a, a less expensive shirt fabric and stuff doesn't feel that different to me. And I've also seen you kind of went to, you know, different shirt makers and, What's your take on shirts today um, versus a few years ago? Um, I think there's two definite phases there and that I had bespoke shirts made at Temple and Asset for quite a long time and they were great, the fit was good, um, but most English shirt makers cannot make a shirt to be worn uh, open-necked to save their lives and they've never been taught how and they don't know how to do it. Um, by contrast, most Italian shirt makers know exactly how to make a button-down shirt that will roll lovely, beautifully around a sports jacket and stay open and sit properly. Um, and I think when I first had an Italian bespoke shirt made that had the collar that worked perfectly in that respect, and that had actually a lot of handwork around the collar and around inserting the sleeve and so on, I, it was just, it was incredible. And I don't think I've, I've never looked back. Um, I think I've often said again, which you probably picked up on, that I don't think there's a bigger difference in any other area of clothing than there is between English and Italian bespoke shirts. Because uh, it just seems to be incredible that English shirt makers do the absolutely no sewing by hand exactly the same as any kind of as a ready to wear shirt. And I just don't think it's important. You know? and, and there are valid historical reasons for that. You know, they see it very much as something that was doesn't have to fit very closely and remained under a jacket and you just needed a kind of good high stiff collar that kind of projected your face well and you may never be taking your jacket off anyway. Um, 
but yeah, I think it's a very, very big difference. Um, and as a result, I've always had ones made by a small number of the kind of Italian bespoke shirt makers ever since. Okay. So would you say the handwork is much more important than the machine work? Like, how can you feel the difference? Um, it is important. I wouldn't say it's as important as with shoes or jackets, for example. Um, but there are kind of a handful of few obvious areas that does make a difference. Um, so attaching the collar by hand, for example, if you, I can't remember when I first saw somebody doing this, but if you watch somebody attaching a collar to a shirt by hand, when they put it around um, like a collar stand, a wooden stand, button the shirt and then attach the collar by hand and then unbutton the collar. And of course, when you unbutton it, the collar stays round. Whereas yep. if you touch the machine, you do it flat like that and you let it go and it's still flat. And it just seems so obvious that one that remains that's sewn in the round is going to stay have stay in your shape uh, better around your neck, particularly when it's unbuttoned. So, um, you know, you, you just mentioned that, you know, you've got new shirts and stuff. So do you just keep all the old things and, and add on to your wardrobe? Or is it kind of a one in one out? What's your approach to that? I try to do one in one out when I can, increasingly difficult, but that was for a long time. That was my policy. Um, particularly at the beginning when I was replacing ready to wear clothing with spoke clothing. That was my policy. Um, it's now harder. Um, I've got rid of a few old, um, my first bespoke suits, but most of them I still have. Um, shirts is kind of easier because shirts do wear out or just get you know, dirty over time as well. Um, in a way that suits don't necessarily, that's easier, but yeah, it's. So, so what does your current wardrobe look like? How many suits do you have? How many shirts, you know, English, Italian, what's the ratio or Japanese or whatever, like. French. Um, I don't know what the ratio is. I don't like to think about this too much, but I have one wardrobe of suits and one wardrobe of jackets, and then I have a whole bunch in storage, um, mostly for between seasons. So I have stuff in storage for autumn and winter and then swap it around for spring and summer. Um, uh, but then the storage is probably by now actually bigger than the the amount that's out. So you can't actually bring everything out when you want to. So you have to change things around. Oh, again. wow. So do you exchange them seasonally then, or are yeah. they the ones in storage just in storage? Yeah, no, every season, yeah. Okay, all right. How about uh, top coats and overcoats? I saw you had one made by Edward Sexton. Uh, mm. It's very nice. So how many overcoats do you keep in your wardrobe? Um, let's see. I think I probably have five now that I wear regularly. Um, top coats are that kind of sexy one, which is a very heavy overcoat. Um, so they, theoretically, they'll have a place in a kind of range of um, coats, but you know, I'm not going to kid myself. You don't need more than one or two, really. Okay. So in terms of colors and patterns, what would you say is, is predominant for you with your suits, with your jackets, and your overcoats? Hmm. Um, I don't wear very many patterns. Um, I tend to prefer... Uh, interest in the kind of the weave of the material. So mm -hmm. really like Harris and Donegal tweeds, for example, um, like the kind of material, the, the change in, in texture of kind of an, an end on end cloth and a herringbone or a pick and pick different kind of variations shark like that. Skin maybe like, you know, do you wear things like a shark skin pattern or a small herringbone pattern, or do you purely prefer solids? but like a, a Donegal tweet, you know, which is very bold and doesn't need a pattern at all. Oh, I see. No, well, it's kind of small patterns as well. Yeah, yeah. So I have a, yeah, a few herring bones um, and a couple of Prince of Wales, which I quite like. Um, but it is fairly plain. I think I tend to I often like playing with slightly different, slightly varying colors and tones and things um, rather than a lot of patterns. Okay. All right. So knowing what you know now, if you'd had to start building a wardrobe again, what would be, you know, the first sport coats and suits that you would acquire? Oh, uh, big question. I think it, well, it depends a lot on your, when you're going to wear them, what kind of work environment you have. Um, What's like a regular office job where, you know, you, you can wear a suit and... and so, well, again... Again, depends. Some of the jobs are very casual these days, but um, say if you're going to a job which usually requires a kind of a jacket, then 
eight to start with a, a navy worsted suit, probably like a 13 ounce, fairly solid worsted navy suit. Um, you'd have a grey as well, possibly a charcoal as the third one, um, some black and very dark brown shoes, plain blue, plain white shirts. But so what about sport coats? You know, suits are easy because they're like the standard, right? The colors. Mm -hmm. With the sport coats, you can have different patterns and colors. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think for that kind of environment, that's fairly, um, that's fairly professional. Um, I think you're definitely going to have a navy sports coat in there, like a navy cashmere or something, or a navy hop sack for the summer. Um, you're probably going to want. You know, more. casually on the weekends, what what would you wear when you're not in the office? Kind of oh, what do you find is most versatile for you. So, uh, and uh, cashmere's that look like tweeds um, or tweed kind of patterns. Um, so a Donegal cashmere ribbon actually jacket in brown, which I really, really like and wear a lot. Um, two tweeds, a brown tweed and a green tweed from Giffinelli and Caliendo, which I wear a lot at the weekend as well. Um, I think they probably all have in common that they all, they all have color and pattern color involved in them that you wouldn't be able to get away really within the office because actually the tweeds that are kind of certainly close up are quite bright colors combined together and overall it might just look like green or brown but um all those colors kind of come together i mean it wouldn't really be formal enough for a professional environment yeah yeah and it's okay you know like professional is one thing and, and casual is another but mm -hmm. uh, I, I quite enjoy it you know choose maybe some bolder patterns or different patterns you know yeah. uh, i don't know a brown beige houndstooth that you may not wear to an office but it's perfectly fine on the weekend mm -hmm. yeah but what would you say are your you know your hobbies outside of your job and permanent style is there much time for anything else um not a lot of time um i have two small daughters so most of the rest of the time um i'm a big reader um with a lot of literature like film a lot, do a lot of cycling and running. A lot of my generally do a lot of endurance sports for my sporting activities. Um, but yeah, hard to combine all of them. Oh, I believe it. I believe it, especially with a day job and another full time job, basically. So, you know, one of the series of questions we always ask, and you've answered some of them, are just a number of short questions, so you can just answer quickly. Okay. Yep. All right. So, um, Oxford or Derby. Probably Oxfords most of the time. Flannels or worsteds? Uh, probably flannels. Necktie or bow tie? Necktie. Braces or suspenders? Neither. <laughs> oh, I say, well, <laughs> I say, well, I don't wear either, but I probably, but I say braces. Okay. So you always go with side adjusters then? Hmm. Okay. Just because or? Why do you find oh, them more comfortable? Yeah, lots of reasons. Um, uh, I find I find wearing braces, yeah, fairly uncomfortable. Certainly as uncomfortable as wearing a belt. Um, so I never I never wear a belt either. But I never understand people that say that you know they wear suspenders because they don't have to wear a belt. But it's just as uncomfortable having something over. Um, I think very high waisted trousers with braces can look look great with a jacket, but often look a bit silly when you take the jacket off um, and I don't wear a jacket all the time so I think often that's not a great look when you take the jacket off. Okay. Double cuff or French cuff? Uh, French cuff. Undershirt or no undershirt? No undershirt. Off the record we spoke. We spoke. Yeah, all right. We just asked everybody the same question so I had to include that. Okay. so. What can we expect from permanent style in, in the future? Are you working on new books? Uh, tell us more. Yeah, um, we've been working on some things on the website, um, which hopefully should come out soon. Um, there'll certainly be, uh, there'll probably be one new book this year. We're not exactly sure what, either kind of another permanent style publication or another uh, hard copy publication. Well, yeah, you should definitely go over there, check out Permanent Style. And thank you very much, Simon, for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem.